Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Spursky. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is Armin Vartanian, the head of workplace at LinkedIn. And he'll be telling us what's going on with LinkedIn and it's some of the findings that it's figuring out on hybrid work and remote work. So Armen, can you tell me a little bit more about the most recent Link LinkedIn Workforce Conference Index on this topic, Workplace Conference Index? Yeah, so specifically um, at LinkedIn, we've got a hybrid um, policy that's predicated mm -hmm. around trust. Um, it's foundational uh, value for us, um, specifically trust and care. And rooted within that is this idea that relationships is really important. Relationships matters is what, how we define it. Um, and trust is, uh, I think, paramount in today's world uh, mm -hmm. to ensure that there's a successful hybrid um, strategy in place for organizations like LinkedIn. Um, specifically one that is not rooted in um, a return to office mandates um, mm -hmm. that so many other companies, I think, are uh, having a struggle right now and trying to drive uh, the right level of engagement with their workforce um, around how they work. Yeah. Um, and the trust aspect of, you know, ensuring that that as an employer, we trust our employees to do the right thing uh, as it relates to where where the location is uh, that works best for them and their teams um, is not just is not just one directional. It's not just focused from the employer to employee perspective, um, but it's also reciprocal. Um, employees, um, there needs to be a, a shared understanding and a shared responsibility mm -hmm. between employees to employers around this notion of uh, social capital and the important social capital plays in creating um, deeper cross-functional, cross-organizational relationships that is going to be very important for organizations to mm -hmm. succeed in navigating this new world of um, a more flexible type of work arrangement for um, employees. So tell me a little bit more about the term social capital and how you would differentiate that from culture. Yeah, good, good question. Social capital specifically is this network of relationships among people uh, who live and work uh, in a company uh, to mm -hmm. function effectively. Um, you know, culture is a little bit more rooted in how, uh, you know, process gets done throughout an organization, um, the shared norms of a company, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what we found uh, through some McKinsey studies is that uh, engagement is 50% uh, um, employees are 50% more engaged when uh, there is the presence of social capital. And we know that there's deeper relationships to be had uh, when individuals, when employees are um, building relationships in person versus virtually. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the, the downstream implications of, of social capital is that you get um, greater retention, greater engagement, mm -hmm. and with relationships that obviously leads to productivity. That makes sense to me. Now I helped 23 companies by now transition to hybrid work and remote work. And one of the important things about social capital I've been finding is that there's a difference between employees who have been at the company for a while versus junior employees. The senior employees who have been experienced employees who have built up a network of relationships within the company, they feel that it's fine for them to you know, just come to the office maybe one day a week to cultivate and maintain those pre-existing relationships, maybe build some new relationships occasionally, but junior employees don't have that social capital. So let's talk a little bit about your perspective on what should be the difference, if any, from your perspective on how often these two group cohorts should be coming to the office, given yeah, this importance of social capital. Yeah, very, very good differentiation. Um, uh, the I, I think first and foremost, across the organization, employees crave social interactions. We are human being, we're social creatures. Mm -hmm. It's the reason why we've returned to restaurants and bars mm -hmm. and 
sure. gone, gone to travel, right? 76% of our employees want to come back to our offices for informal interactions. There's a Microsoft Work Trend Index uh, study that has been done where 85% of the workforce are motivated to come back to rebuild relationships. So I think across the company, regardless of tenure, there's a desire to come in and, and build uh, deeper relationships with each other. Um, but um, to your point, uh, taking the the view from the current economic from the current state that we're in, um, over the past uh, three years, effectively, uh, the majority fifty five percent approximately of our employees have started at LinkedIn. Mm. Um, it's a similar trend that we see with other companies that have, uh, considering the growth of some of our organizational, sure. um, some of our organizations in our industry. And to your, and again, to your point, it's really important for those individuals to build those deep lasting relationships across organizations so that they can work more effectively longer term um, during mm. their tenure. Now, one of the challenges I've been finding with other companies is that the junior employees want to build relationships, but senior employees, because they already have those relationships, they feel it's fine to, you know, like I said, come in maybe once a week. And the junior employees, that's a challenge for them to build relationships with more senior people. Once, I mean, they tell me when I do focus groups that, and I was literally doing one this morning, that once they meet a senior employee, an experienced employee, they feel fine reaching out to that person remotely. But before they actually meet them in person, it's really tough for them to reach out remotely and have those connections remotely. And what I've been thinking about and working with those companies on and what I found has worked well is creating deliberate mentoring programs that provide opportunities for senior employees to mentor junior employees and meet them at the same time sometimes. So maybe having one senior employee would take five junior employees out to lunch, maybe co-work by five junior employees in the same area for a couple of hours to connect with them, answer their questions and so on. So creating structured programming that would enable, that solves the problem. And I'm curious, what are your thoughts about mentoring as one way of solving the problem of junior employees building those social connections? I think it's it, it, mentoring is important, but I, I, I think there needs to be intentionality and predictability mm -hmm. at the root of all of these um, uh, programs that we've got that's um, founded in flexibility. And I think it gets back to this idea where cross organizational norms are really important. The, and that's gonna lead to some level of value proposition for the employees. I think regardless of whether it's mentoring or other programs to drive social capital in the office, um, uh, team-based innovative collaborative types of work sessions, Employees that decide to come into the office on any given day want to ensure that when they're there, they're getting value from that experience. Sure. Um, they want to know when they get, if they get in their car, they're going on public transit, that they're there to interact with other people. Um, you know, our, our spaces, we develop um, many types of, you know, flexible types of environments throughout the office to accommodate mm -hmm. a bunch of different work habits, but our spaces are nothing without our employees. And that's what really that's what really drives the experience. Um, so our, our at a higher level, our focus has been twofold around this idea, and it's really centered around this this equation uh, that I've been giving a lot of thought. And the equation is is pretty simple. It's it's the numerator, which is employee behavior, and the denominator, which is the supply of space. Hmm. And we've we've um, you know been very thoughtful about how to constrain supply to drive more interactions with folks. Um, mm. And that's a very positive effect um, on our attendance patterns and the experience folks have had in our offices. So let's dive a little bit deeper into that. What have you done in the office? And I know LinkedIn has had some serious innovative changes in its office space to facilitate collaboration. So what have you done to do that? To go a yes. little deeper into that. Yeah, so so from the supply perspective, just simply by constraining supply, um, we look at a number of core metrics um, centered around utilization, um, planning ratios, an experience index that's a bottom-up index to measure the experience employees have when they're in our space, 
But simply mm -hmm. by constraining supplies and forcing more people in less amount of space, we've actually driven up attendance. So organically, again, this idea that employees want to have that social interaction, we've seen an increase in attendance since mm. constraining supplies. Our offices in our largest six core, core markets around the world are all experiencing utilization levels that are greater than that of prior to the pandemic. Oh, wow. I think 70 to 75% utilizations on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays in some of our largest markets. Hmm. That's really interesting. So at other clients, one of the challenges, one of the things we've been working on and that we've had challenges with is establishing something like a common day in the office, you know, once a week to address the problem of coordination of having critical mass of people. And what we've been finding is that when we do something like a one common day in the office, there tends to be an, a, lots of people in the office and they find that the meeting rooms are booked that they plan to use, the huddle rooms are booked, soundproofed rooms that they wanted to have with client calls that they can't use. So they need, they're taking calls at their desks and they're disturbing others and they can't get spaces that they would need. So how are you solving for that sort of problem where you you would have too many people coming in for the amount of space and people would be kind of overcrowding each other? Right. So we're, we're constantly looking at capacity. I mean, the short answer is we're constantly looking at utilization mm. capacity to accommodate. But I think the, the, the longer answer to this is that yeah. organizational norms are very important. And it's not just around the days folks come together to interact with each other, but it's the, the types of activities that happen when folks are together. Um, otherwise, you're going to get this kind of sporadic microculture of type of, of work that ends up happening within the office or remotely. Um, you may come in and have an experience that is not ideal coming in and sitting in a yeah. video conferencing office all day because the remainder of your team is not in the office. Um, so what you want to do is create those, again, cross-organizational norms. That's very, you know, paramount uh, to develop the social capital, but it also creates a better experience overall um, in the type of work that you're doing with your teammates on any given day that you happen to be in the office or remotely. And one of the things that I find that people need to learn is to do different types of work when remotely and when they're coming to the office. And especially managers, I find managers struggle with this. They don't know, from my experience, they have a difficult time managing people when those people are remote. For example, they find that they tell me that, well, you know, people aren't handing in tasks at the kind of timelines I want. I have difficulty getting hold of them. And I tell them that, look, you're the manager. You're supposed to figure out coordination. It's not the worker who's procrastinating or not available. You need to have clear expectations and you need to coordinate effectively so that you know where workers are. Set a common hour, for example, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., where everyone's supposed to answer their Slack messages or Microsoft Teams messages within 30 minutes. Someone's supposed to answer their email within an hour or something like that. Have an emergency system, you know, text someone if you need to get a hold of them quickly. So how do you solve the problem of teaching managers how to manage effectively in this increasingly more remote hybrid world? Yeah, I mean, I think like, I think two things uh, immediately come to mind is um, the organizational norms that organ that companies can create by being more predictable on the days folks come in and not mm -hmm. leads to intentional investing, right? Um, without it, it's a bit chaotic. It's like a company that operates with an irregular heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, being intentional, then you can invest in the right areas to amplify the right types of behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, if you knew the the organizational norm of the cadence of folks coming in versus not, or how we or where we're hiring from, and what the expectation of our employees are that are near an office versus in a market that we don't have offices, again, you can invest in the right learning and development programs. You can mm -hmm. invest in the right technology to you know maybe ubiquitous technology systems to. Um, drive ease and frictionless collaboration. You can invest in in the right types of cultural programs at LinkedIn. We have an in-day uh, that we allocate um, uh, a day a, a month uh, that's centered around our values and, and culture. Mm -hmm. um, 
to help amplify that and strengthen that across the organization. Um, we've got, you know, from a norms perspective, reconnect days that happen on a regular cadence too, just so that we can bring the, it's a, essentially, it's a formal um, re-onboarding of sorts across the entire mm -hmm. organization. So again, I think norms is really important here and you can then invest in the right types of programs to amplify the right types of behaviors for your employees. Excellent. And so as we're wrapping up, what do you think would be the future of hybrid work at LinkedIn and, and more broadly, but you know, you're specializing in LinkedIn, so you can focus on that. Yeah, I, I think hybrid, you know, I hate to say it's the future of work because it's already here. Um, I think there's refinements to be had. I and mean, that's what we're doing at LinkedIn. We're constantly iterating and learning and going through this process, whether it's from um, how we work and the workflows um, mm -hmm. that are changing due to technological advancements uh, to the types of spaces that we're designing to create um, spaces that are uh, conforming to uh, how employees work and the varied ways that that's going to that's gonna be done within our environments. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Armand. That was very, very helpful. Thank you, Glob. Nice, ni nice chatting with you. Nice chatting with you too. And thank you to the listeners and viewers for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Sure. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you check us out and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and it helps us improve the show. All right, everyone. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.